In Nomen von dem Bund will ich anerkennen die traditionelle Rapite von Land, wo wir treffen sich heint, das Warangeri Volk, von dem kühlen Volk. Und wir geben ab Covid seine Immes und Oves von dem Over, von dem Ossid und Zukunftsdicke. Schönen Dank euch im Zuhörer. Ich begrüße euch wieder in Namen von der Bundorganisation Melbourne. Ich hoffe, dass ihr seid alle gesund und in der Heim. Wir führen uns noch alt mit unseren Podcasten, wo wir reden wegen in Jonem, was haben zu tun mit jüdisch Leben und Kultur. In the name of the Bund, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we find ourselves today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Yin Paradis is an Aboriginal Asian Anglo-Australian who is the Chair in Race Relations and Indigenous Knowledge and Culture Coordinator at Deakin University. His research interests focus on the health, social and economic effects of racism as well as anti-racism theory, policy and practice across diverse settings. Welcome Yin and thanks for joining us today. Thanks Alan. Yin, some, some people have said that I've got a very good face for radio. Our listeners can't see you, but there is nothing about your look that immediately suggests Aboriginality. From what age were you aware of your Indigenous roots and how important are they to you? Well, I guess the first thing to mention is that there really isn't an Aboriginal look, not these days, not like there was 230 years ago. Uh, you know, Australians come in all shapes and sizes and colours and haircuts and same thing with Aboriginal people. So for me, uh, yeah, I've, I've known uh, that I'm Aboriginal from, you know, birth, I guess, or whenever I could understand such things. And that's been an uh, yeah, important part of my life and my family and extended family you know, to varying degrees throughout a day, a week, a month or a year. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not news at any particular point for me, no. What was your experience of growing up as an Indigenous Australian Union? Well, I mean, I grew up for the first nine years of my life in Townsville. Uh, and yeah, we didn't have so many relatives around in that place. Um, so it was just my mum and I and my brother as mostly the Aboriginal people that I knew of at, at that time. And then we moved to Darwin and my, many more of my extended family were living there. Lots of other Aboriginal kids at school uh, with me. So yeah, it was different. It was good to be in Darwin. It's very multicultural there. and uh, I got to be part of a broad Aboriginal community and a bunch of other different uh, ethnicities and backgrounds there as well. Did, did non-Aboriginal kids um, know about your Indigenous background? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, some of them did, some of them didn't. It wasn't uh, sort of advertised, but if it came up in conversation as it did in various times, I think mostly people knew. Yeah, some people thought it was of interest, some people didn't. Some people had questions about, you know, how you could, how could I be Aboriginal when I didn't look like it and that sort of stuff. So sometimes it led to difficult, uh, interesting, challenging conversations. At other times it was just, uh, oh yeah, sure, that's interesting and let's move on. Yeah. Was there any direct discrimination that you were aware of as a child growing up in Townsville or Darwin? Yeah, sure. I mean, there were a number of things. Really, part of it was to do with some of those stereotypes about what Aboriginal people are meant to look like. And so I was the brunt of those at times, you know, um, discourses of authenticity. Are you real? Are you not real? What makes you real? These sorts of things. And that's a form of racism that's quite uh, upsetting for people like me, light skinned, fair skinned Aboriginal people. And uh, you know, the reason that we moved uh, from Townsville to Darwin actually was because of the racism in Townsville. So 
my parents decided that they'd had enough of various forms of racism there and uh it was just wasn't working for them so they they moved somewhere else where you know there was still racism but of a different kind and not as uh i guess intense and as um old-fashioned forms of racism as you you had in that uh part of north queensland yeah in what other ways you you mentioned that the racism was of different kind in what other ways was it different from those you just mentioned i guess there were just more aboriginal people around in darwin so that there wasn't that kind of uh people understood the diversity of aboriginal people a lot more and they had some knowledge of aboriginal culture but at the same time you still had these kind of uh ideas about um Aboriginal people as, uh, you know, kind of stupid or drunk or maybe also as uh, getting too many handouts from the government. These sort of ideas circulated around as they do in all sorts of parts of Australia, but they were still there in, in Darwin to some extent. Uh, but it's a much, it's a more kind of, um, I guess, a type of racism that comes from interacting with people more rather than just an abstract form that's drawing from media stereotypes that was more likely and more more happened more often in townsville yeah. but, but some of those things that you mentioned in particular this notion that uh, indigenous australians get very generous handouts um from the government uh, things that you would hear now, you would hear them in Melbourne, you would hear them in Sydney, you would hear them in, um, you know, rural and regional centres where there's almost no experience uh, of people mixing with Indigenous Australians. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I just, it must be a kind of, uh, these sort of stereo, racist stereotypes must be uh, promoted by the media. That's why people, yeah, know about them all over the country, regardless of how many Aboriginal people they know personally or what proportion of Aboriginal people live in their community. So I think it is a kind of a, a very persistent idea that gets around that is partly due to, yeah, some of the ongoing attacks and critiques, particularly from right wing commentators and so forth on uh, who's a real Aboriginal person, who deserves what in Australia, and, and just basic myths about, uh, about this level of handouts and so forth and benefits, which are, are rarely ever uh, substantiated in fact. And of course, you know, uh, any programs that we do have are all about addressing the very significant disadvantage in, in health and, and social outcomes that Aboriginal people still experience today. Um, in there was recently some controversy about Bruce Pascoe and comments from Indigenous Australians that he didn't or wasn't entitled to an award that he received because he wasn't Indigenous. How did, how did you react to that debate? What, what was your view about what was going on there? Oh, it makes me very angry to, to hear about this kind of internal um, backstabbing that goes on in, in in aboriginal communities sometimes called lateral violence it's a form of internalized racism i think and you know it's it's convenient i think uh that it divides us further as a community and and supports the kind of ongoing efforts by certain yeah certain segments of australian society to basically control who's indigenous and who's not and and decide uh, among the idea is of course to reduce the number of aboriginal people that are recognized as such and that reduces our political power and our ability to um, help each other and contribute to australian society but it's because aboriginal people are often considered quite threatening still to the the national story uh to the rights and privileges of a lot of australians even though it's not true i mean we saw that with land rights you know the whole idea of people's backyards being stolen and so forth so i think um i don't agree with any of that identity policing that goes on i think that uh bruce pascoe for example is uh, doing amazing things to add to our knowledge of history and our possibilities for future uh, of things like um, indigenous agriculture in australia and he does have aboriginal heritage 
and he finds that something that's important to him, among other things, and that's totally fine with me. But in effect, you're fighting a war on two fronts. I mean, you know, you're fighting the entrenched and systemic racism um, that's really promoted by the non-Indigenous community. And then you're fighting a second front uh, within your own um, First Nations people. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? It's been a problem for for centuries, uh, Alan. It's, it's kind of... Uh... The impacts of colonisation are not don't stop at the at the sort of front gate of the Aboriginal community, so to speak. They they colonisation infiltrates, and you know, ever since we've had uh, Aboriginal people forced to be part of the native police in Australia, you know, in the late nineteenth century, we've had people who are going out and oppressing our um, our own communities, and often by force, but. You know, people can be sold on on the benefits of colonialism. They can become part of that police force, very you know broadly, metaphorically defined, that um, that continues to perpetrate colonisation. So, it is a it is a it is a conflict fought on many fronts. And I think um, decolonising needs to happen within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as well as within the broader Australian community in in different ways. It's almost like you're talking here of a Stockholm syndrome where um, the kidnapped person, the hostage, begins to identify um, with the kidnapper. Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. And it happens over generations. And that's, you know, very much um, on purpose, very much intentionally uh, through things like stolen generations and assimilationist approaches broadly. This has been the, this is the whole point of colonisation is to uh exterminate aboriginal and torres strait islander people that's the general purpose of it and you know it started with massacres and moved on to indoctrination of various sorts including children being taken away and, and the idea is that uh, aboriginal people were meant to die out and and uh, there is still you know there still are aspects of the way we operate in our culture and our society that are really about uh making Aboriginal people like other Australians, particularly Anglo white Australians, uh, that continues to this day. And so it's a battle, it's a struggle to, to retain uh, strong and vibrant Indigenous cultures in the face of a kind of uh, cultural imperialism that comes uh, across within uh, Western Eurocentric cultures that dominate the continent of Australia. Yin, uh, to what degree are you involved in um, Indigenous politics? And if so, at what age did you get involved in it? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by Indigenous politics. I'm not really into uh, yeah, politicians or political, formal political systems very much, but I certainly have, um, have a long interest in uh, environmental issues, for example, so which are very closely tied to Indigenous culture. We are very interested in caring for country and land and environments and non-human life. Uh, and so, yeah, from uh, early 20s, I've attended various, you know, protests and got involved in that sort of uh, what can we do to help our environment, really. And so continuing to this day where I'm involved in groups like Extinction Rebellion and these sorts of, um, and other groups that are about uh, raising awareness really of, of climate change and the sixth mass extinction that we're in at the moment, because these issues are really central to, to Aboriginal uh, people. You know, we, we just, uh, this just part of our culture, you know, the, the, the health of the environment. You, um, growing up, was it always your intention to have a career, an academic career, specialising in Indigenous issues? No, no. I mean, I was always interested in uh, an academic career. Yep, I wanted to to do a PhD and become an academic. But uh, when I started in my undergraduate degree, uh, my major was theoretical physics. So uh, that's changed quite a lot since then, and mostly due to 
a uh, indigenous cadetship that I got. So my parents said to me in first year uni, you should really get a job. And I said, oh, that's annoying. I wasn't planning to. And uh, they suggested this cadetship program and I ended up working, you know, during the university breaks mostly and also uh, a little bit during the semesters at uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and Welfare Statistics Unit. So that's when I became interested in Indigenous health. And from there, that kind of had a strong influence on what sort of study I did from that point onwards. I mean, you, you have published extensively. You have uh, appeared in, uh, on, on radio and television, uh, in, in print media. Um, how have you used that profile within the Indigenous community and outside of it to try and shine a spotlight on what's going on? Well, a lot of my research is focused on very applied social issues such as racism and cultural competence, intercultural understanding. And now in the recent years, more explicitly on, on teaching and researching Indigenous knowledges as well. Uh, so yeah, there's, it's, a, it's really an a educational process to, to help people become aware of the extent of racism in uh, societies and what they can do about it, uh, how it impacts them personally in their relationships and the organizations that they, they work and interact with. So yeah, it's a strong educational element and working with other people who are passionate about addressing racism and helping them with you know uh, academic uh, research and knowledge to try and do a better job of whatever activist and um, action they're involved in, in, in their in their work or in their uh, organisations that they're involved in as uh, outside of work. You, you, I want to ask you a few simple questions now. I, I'm sure some of our listeners like me have grappled with um, the, the way we use language in relation to Indigenous Australians. So what, what I want to start asking you is about Aboriginal people refer to an elder as auntie or uncle. And as I understand it, the term elder is frequently, but certainly not necessarily age related. Is it appropriate for me to refer to indigenous elder as auntie or uncle? Uh, yeah, generally it is. Yeah, uh, it's good to just check with somebody first, of course, uh, but it's a term of respect that has to do with really the importance of relationships in Aboriginal culture and, and family. So um, in a lot of Aboriginal cultures, certainly traditionally, uh, kinship is really important. So everyone has relations to everybody else and has a place within a system of, of kin. So that's where it comes from. And it's a you know, term, as you said, it's a term of respect for elders, whether they're particularly old or not, they're respected members of indigenous communities and they have uh, knowledge and understanding and wisdom that we want to recognize and so yeah you refer to them as auntie and uncle to emphasize the relationship and the sort of relationship of someone who's a generation uh, above you uh, that's the idea of it yeah how do you get to become an elder well there's no formal process it's all uh, uh, a lot of what happens in Aboriginal cultures are based on reputational economy, if you will. So what's your reputation? What have you contributed to the community? Uh, is there anyone else who would say that you're an elder already? So it's kind of, it's not the sort of thing that you apply for or you uh, get awarded in any sense. And uh, for some people, you might be an elder, for some people, others, you may not be. And uh, you just basically, uh, do your best to contribute to making the world a better place. And uh, perhaps one day uh, people might recognize you in some circles as, as an elder. And, and, and really what you want to do is to be able to provide advice to people who are looking for it rather than worry about whether they call you auntie and uncle. And those sort of people who uh, epitomize the wisdom and humility and respect and compassion and care that are valued in indigenous cultures are the most likely to be elders and also the most likely to not really be concerned about whether they are or not. Right. Um, Yin, 
What's the difference between an acknowledgement of country and a welcome to country? Yeah, so an acknowledgement of country is something that anyone can do to pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land that you're gathered on uh, and remember the importance of country, as we call it. Country means, it's not doesn't mean anything to do with nations, It's it just means um, everything around us, all the life that we see, including the living uh, earth uh, as part of our family, as part of our kin. And we call that all of those living systems, ecosystems, if you will, we call that country. So you pay respect to country. Uh, anyone can do that. You just need to know a little bit about where you are and, and say something uh, hopefully authentic about your feelings about that. And welcome to country is only done by those traditional custodians that you are recognizing in the acknowledgement. So you might ask local traditional elders to come along and uh, do a welcome to country for bigger events. You can do acknowledgements at pretty much any event or uh, anything that's happening, but welcomes are usually reserved for more uh, larger scale formal events. Uh, thanks for clarifying that for me because there was some confusion in my mind because I was at an event once when clearly, uh, and I knew the person, he was not an Indigenous Australian, uh, said he was going to do welcome to country and I, not knowing the difference, I didn't realise that that was inappropriate. But thanks for clarifying that. Um, Yin, you and your, your Jewish wife um, have chosen to send your two children to Shalom Aleichem College in Melbourne. Why Shalom Aleichem? Well, I thought it was important uh, for my two kids to have a strong connection to their Jewish culture. And they do already have that through their mother's side of the family. But uh, it seemed like a good opportunity to do that in a school context as well. I was very um, interested in the trilingual teachings that happen at the school. Language is important and especially languages that are, you know, not very common these days, a bit endangered perhaps. Uh, it's good to promote those. And it's also good for kids to have multiple languages. And the background, of course, the Bundes background and the social justice underpinnings of Shalom are a very important part of that, uh, a decision to send the kids there as well. So, Yin, do you, you, you've spoken about endangered languages and, and um, Yiddish uh, certainly is an endangered language in many ways. Uh, and, and we have probably lost quite a few of our Indigenous First Nations languages already. But other than that obvious um, comparison, do you see any other overlaps between the experiences of Jews and Indigenous Australians? Sure, I think uh, there are experiences in terms of uh, long histories of being considered minority group that uh, are persecuted, a uh, group that is um, considered uh, dangerous to broader society in many uh, ep epochs of history and have been similar attempts to eliminate really eliminate those uh, both Jewish people and Aboriginal people from certain parts of the world um, where they are welcome and where in fact, once again, another parallel, both groups have been living for a long time. So obviously Aboriginal people have been living for in Australia for much longer, but certainly Jewish people have you know, put down roots in various parts of the world only to be, uh, have people want to uproot them from there. So I think that that's a really important part of the parallels and, uh, you know, having a culture that's different from the mainstream uh, as well and trying to, to maintain that culture in the face of, you know, uh, the assimilationist impacts of existing in, in, a, in a different society to your, to your heritage in that sense. In at Shalom, the kids will get a great sense of their Jewishness, and and you know on the mother side, there's probably an entire sort of community that they're connected to. But what are you doing to give them a similar sense of their Aboriginality? Well, I would say 
that at this point in their lives, the kids have a stronger Jewish identity than they do an Aboriginal identity. And I'm not really that fussed about uh, identity politics as such. They certainly know that they're Aboriginal and they're proud of that fact. And they are interested in issues to do with Indigenous justice and social justice more broadly. I like the way they are interested in, in, in ideas of fairness and justice and equity and um, some of the injustices and oppression that happen in the world. I think that they, being at Cholom has made them into a mensch as promised. And uh, I think that uh, they will grow, their interest in, in Indigenous affairs I think will grow probably as they hit their teens and in university. That's often where people start to think more about what that means to them uh, personally. At the moment, it's a bit of a background thing and uh, I'm not uh, really into uh, forcing much on the kids. I think the kids learn what they want to learn and I'm certainly have, I'm here to talk to them about that stuff when they want to and um, I feel like that will happen more as they grow older. But it's being an Indigenous identity is something that uh, is complex in many ways and uh, there's uh, pretty intense politics around it and uh, it's probably something better tackled in a depth uh, once you're hit a bit of an older age um, and at the moment I'm just happy that they uh, feel so um, well connected to their Jewish identity and well supported in the Jewish community and I think that's a good base for life in general. Yin, I want to spend a little bit of time with you looking at the Black Lives Matter movement here in Australia. The death of George Floyd in America was a catalyst um, for a desire by Indigenous Australians to focus on and address the systemic racism uh, as evidenced most obviously by black deaths in custody. Now, what, what's interesting in this to me, and I am similarly guilty of this, is that I and many Australians could probably name more African Americans killed by police in the United States than we can Indigenous Australians who have died in custody. Why do you think that's the case? Hmm, that's a good question. I think that it's easier to engage with problems in another place. I think that obviously the United States has a lot of uh, a large media footprint in the world and so there's lots about the country that we hear about uh, that's one thing but the other thing is that it doesn't implicate us uh, as as people living in australia that there are race issues and racism problems in the country across the other side of the world so i guess it's harder to face the reality of the ongoing impacts of colonialism in Australia, including deaths in custody, police violence against Aboriginal people. Uh, and the media, of course, in Australia is part of the problem in that sense. They, they, they will emphasize overseas matters and they will influence what we know uh, about local uh, ongoing uh, systemic racism in our society. And we see that from from uh, the highest leaders of our country, the Prime Minister, you know, obviously not knowing anything about the history of slavery in Australia and um, reinforcing that invisibility of that history through comments that he makes. Yeah, we'll, pick, we'll pick that up in a moment, but um, I want to get your view on the Black Lives Matter marches. Um, one was as recent, I think, on the weekend in Sydney. Um, what was your sense of whether they should have gone ahead, given the situation that we had with the spread of coronavirus? Mm, yeah. I tend to think that expressions of uh, political freedom are very much central to democracies. And it is difficult in this time uh, to continue to express our, our right to protest. And uh, it's put a hold on a lot of protests that would be going on. And I think uh, 
in many ways, we do need to continue with those protests despite COVID-19. So I was in support of these, these people hitting the streets for Black Lives Matters. And uh, I wouldn't like to see it happen every day, but I think that we need to send a message that we're still here, this matters, and uh, black people are still being killed in the same way that COVID kills. Uh, col colonialism is killing us right now. And so, yes, uh, unfortunately, while black people keep dying, uh, uh, when they keep being murdered when they shouldn't be or through neglect or um, omission or omission, then we do need to sometimes be out there visible and showing that happening. And as soon as the colonialism stops killing people, we will stop protesting on the streets. That I can promise you. Eugene, you mentioned before about Scott Morrison's um, comments about there never having been slavery in Australia. Fortunately, that was a position he had to retract given the outcry against it. Having said that, I, I suspect that's either what he really believes, or at least um, if, if there was slavery, it's not really a big deal. Um, my, my sense is we'll never be able to address issues of Indigenous discrimination and racism in Australia until we can admit to our past of dispossession, murder and genocide of First Nations people. But how do we encourage a rethinking of Australia's history that encourages and in fact um, allows for a wide range of opinions to be canvassed? Well, I think it has to start from a very early age. I think that's the thing that, th that we need to incorporate more realistic uh, understandings of Aboriginal people and cultures, you know, from kindergarten onwards. And, and there are efforts along those lines, but uh, it's, it's a, there's a long way to go, you know, uh, you know, the sort of history textbooks, for example, that are used in schools in Australia still don't have very good, uh, sophisticated, information about uh, Aboriginal history and uh, the history of contact and invasion and dispossession. And, you know, just to give you an example, uh, there are no history textbooks used in any of the state or territories in Australia that I'm aware of, and there's been research on this, which are written by Aboriginal people. So as long as colonizers continue to write history, we're never going to get that diversity of perspectives that we need. And as long as those are the only books that people are reading uh, in school, using in schools, teachers are using, we will never get that wide perspective. So that's just an example. But is that because um, books haven't been written by Indigenous Australians about their history that are suitable for use in schools, or is it that the schools just don't want to use those books? It's a bit of both. We do have Aboriginal historians. Uh, some of them have written books, of course. But uh, in many cases, you would be expecting a kind of invitation to, you know, be part of a team uh, to to create, specifically create textbooks. That can happen too. So there's a resistance to it. There's somewhat of a lack of it because, uh, you know, there's an underrepresentation of Aboriginal people within university systems and so forth. So it's a combination of things, but it's certainly something that could be auspiced by governments if they were interested in doing so. So it's not a insurmountable problem uh, if there's a will to address it. And I think that's part of what we're talking about is we're talking about greater willingness uh, on the part of Australian people and government to engage in these difficult conversations about what happened and what continues to happen today. You know, we still have uh, sacred sites being blown up. We still have uh, native forests that are very important, sacred sites as well, to Aboriginal people being destroyed. Um, we have high rates of just the, the level of incarceration of Aboriginal people is, is enormous. And it's good to see that in the new Closing the Gap targets that were released uh, this week, 
we do have a target now, reduce the number of Aboriginal people in jail, you know, and also a recognition that connection to land uh, and, and country and culture is an important part of Aboriginal health. That's also one of the targets. So we're starting to see, I guess, a broadening of understanding of what uh, with what disadvantage is for Aboriginal people. And that gives us an opportunity to invest resources in trying to address those sorts of uh, disparities, not just your basic life expectancy targets. I, I was at a book launch last week, a book written by Michael Gawenda, whose wife you would know from uh, the Shalom community. And the book uh, is titled The Power Broker, and it's about uh, Mark Liebler. Um, a man, a very high profile member of the Jewish community and the legal fraternity who has been an absolutely tireless worker on behalf of Indigenous Australians from the time Noel Pearson came into his firm. Um, in what ways could the Jewish community be more involved and supportive of advancing the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement? Mm. Well, there's many ways. I think there's uh, support in terms of doing whatever you can in whatever role you have to provide a uh, greater voice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So how can we centre views of the Indigenous community more uh, through our everyday lives? What can we do to support Black Lives Matters, to support uh, communities in the time of COVID-19 who you know, uh, we know that, that whatever disasters befall society, that disadvantaged members of society suffer more. And so this is the case right now for Aboriginal people. There's charities you can donate to, there's stuff you can be involved in, there's protests you can support and calls you can support to, you know, how can we help make governments accountable for some of these decisions which have led to uh, ongoing destruction of important um, parts of our environment, uh, there's a treaty process underway at the moment in Victoria that as part of that we'll have a truth and reconciliation uh, process so get involved in that and spread the word about some of these more authentic histories of, of Australia and think about what it is about our society now that we could change to help to decolonise our society so what do we do uh, that continues to create disadvantage for Aboriginal people? How can we reform the education system? How can we change the way governments interact with Aboriginal people? You know, a lot of Jewish people are involved in various parts of, this, of our society. So um, how can we teach our family and friends about and, and dispel any myths about Aboriginal people and teach uh, more accurate information about uh, Aboriginal people now and the histories? Yeah, there's many things to consider. What political parties support a kind of social justice platform where we will see some real change? You know, we have the Uluru Statement from the Heart that was roundly rejected by the, uh, the government that we currently have. So what governments support our implementation of Uluru Statement from the, of the Heart? Can we vote for those people instead of the other ones? You know, that sort of thing. Let me put a personal challenge to you, and that is um, at Passover, which as um, a celebration of liberation of, of Jews from Egypt, maybe you could write something and through the Shalom community, get it incorporated into the Haggadah that is used at Pesach. Uh, and I know uh, we would certainly welcome that. And I know many people in the Bund and the wider community who would welcome that. Uh, as well. So there's a little task for you, Ian. I'm sure you haven't got enough on your plate at the moment, but that is something which uh, which could be great. Yin, uh, look, I, I think we'll finish it up there. Uh, I really do thank you very much for joining us today and hopefully you have um, helped, well you certainly helped me understand a little bit more about the issues confronting Indigenous communities and with some suggestions about how we as a Jewish community can make a contribution um, 
to addressing the systemic racism that is faced by our First Nations people. So, Yin, I look forward to bumping into you in the shell and playground when you have come to pick up your kids and I've come to pick up our grandchildren uh, when this plague has finally left us. And thanks very much for joining us and stay safe and well. Thank you, Alan. Much appreciated. We hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with Indigenous Australian and academic Yin Paradis about his experiences growing up in Townsville and Darwin, his move into academia, the Black Lives Matter movement, the decision he and his Jewish wife took to send their children to Sholem Aleichem College in Melbourne, and how the Jewish community can become more active and effective in advocating for the rights of Indigenous Australians. As we adapt to life under stage four restrictions in Melbourne, we hope you are coping and finding ways to stay in touch with family and friends and looking after yourselves and others. Our thanks as always go to Gideon Price for producing our podcasts. Bis mir treffen sich weiter, bleibt gesund und stark.